Welcome back to another message from the Little Church World. If this is your first time, we are very excited that you've joined us and we want to give you a special welcome. We urge you to spend the next 20 or so minutes with us as we explore some special topics and wisdom from the God's Word spoken by our leaders here at the Little Church World. Welcome to the Little Church World, and if you're a regular visitor, then welcome back. Today, I want to talk about joy. Have you ever thought of happiness, true joy, as something to be practiced? Or have you really only thought of joy as the result of something good that happens to you? I'm going to begin by revealing the answer straight away, because whilst joy is often thought of as the result of external events in truth, it is something that we have to practice. Just as the body needs physical exercise, the mind and heart also require repetitive motions to be strengthened. Exercise for the mind is more easily found because education is a primary focus for many families. However, how often do you exercise your heart? How often do you practice believing and so feeling the promises of God? If I were to wager, I'd bet that most of us almost never practice these things, or at least we don't treat them as exercise when doing so. But we need to if we want our hearts to become strong. You see, the core idea behind weightlifting is that we use the very things designed to keep us down to make our bodies stronger. And in the same way, when circumstances and events in our lives seem designed to keep us down, we can use them as exercise to make our hearts stronger. And for many of us, our emotions are largely determined by the events of that day or those leading up to it. Our fears, anxieties, and the things that sadden or anger us are often behind the wheel of our heart, dictating the direction in which we move. In truth, we can find it difficult to navigate towards a more stable happiness, that is one not fleeting and unaffected by external conditions. Of course, Christians will know that the Bible teaches that joy is found in Christ, but how do we practically sustain it? First, it's important to establish something fundamental to practicing joy. That is that joy is not phased by our circumstances. So what is happening around us, therefore, should not determine our joy. Have you ever met someone who never seems to be happy about anything? They complain about everything, and you can't do anything to make them happy. This was never meant to be our natural state. In the Garden of Eden, God created man to be in fellowship with him, Adam and Eve were safe in the presence of God and had peace as they communed with him daily. However, because of their fall, man is no longer born in communion with God. Today, we all need to actively choose to be with him and receive the Holy Spirit. So when we choose to walk with him through the gift of Jesus Christ, we can count on such promises as revealed in Psalms 27, which reads, For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. When writing Psalm 27, David's circumstances were dire, and it would be natural should he be in distress. His enemies surrounded him, yet he was still able to offer up shouts of joy to the Lord. How did he do this? Was he simply so special that his joy endured? No, that's not the case. His heart was strengthened through prayer and communion with God. David rarely stopped seeking his father, and he truly believed that God would do anything for him. No matter how terrible things might look, his joy endured as he continued to connect with God. This is what God wants each of us to do. As 1 Thessalonians 5.16 reveals, to be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for those who belong in Christ Jesus. When the Israelites were traveling in the wilderness after being freed from Egyptian slavery, they were complaining to Moses about their circumstances, even though they could see God was providing for them. They despised their situation so much, despite God's provision, so God used the situation to try and teach them that they could trust in him. He sent venomous snakes among them and instructed Moses to fashion a bronze snake and put it high upon a pole. 
And while the snakes were swarming about their feet and biting them, God told Moses that everyone who would look up to the bronze snake on the pole would not be harmed by snakes biting them. But still, some would not listen, and the ones who did not look up died. All the Israelites needed to do was look up in order to survive. God was trying to teach them the power of obedience so they would stay safe, which is a lesson he tries to teach us today. For in him, no matter what is happening around us, we can be safe. To attain and retain our joy, we need to trust in him and be thankful because he is good for his word. And whatever we might be going through, we can know that when we look to God, we are his and we can find the joy that endures all circumstances because our joy comes from him. You might ask how it's possible to experience joy in times of suffering. How can we be joyful when life is just awful? We can simply because joy is found in God and comes only from Him. It is something that we receive through talking to Him and remembering His promises and instructions. He gives joy when we focus on Him as an anchor for our souls to steady us when the waves come crashing down. Let's look at the story of Peter and the other disciples who found themselves in a stormy lake in a small boat. This is found in Matthew chapter 14. And although this passage is titled, Jesus Walks on the Water, I want us to focus on Peter walking on the water for a few minutes. The boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. One thing I would like you to notice is that Jesus did not calm the storm until Peter was already walking on the water. He called Peter out to him and called Peter to focus on him, even though there was a storm raging around him. Peter was then able to do something impossible. With his faith in Jesus, which came from focusing on Jesus, he was able to step out of the boat and actually walk on water. When we are keeping our eyes on Jesus, we do not have to worry or be afraid. And if we keep this attitude, our joy also does not have to waver. God won't always change your circumstances. He didn't slow the storm for Peter, but he gives us the power to do the impossible despite and through our circumstances or suffering. Having joy may seem like an impossible task when you're suffering, but as Jesus showed us with Peter, he can help us to do impossible things in impossible situations when we keep our eyes upon him. A good strategy that can help you keep your joy is to also remind yourself of all of the things that God has already done in your life, reminding yourself of his promises when you're going through tough times. Remember that although weeping may come in the night, joy comes in the morning. It is also very important to remind yourself of the growth and maturity that comes out of seasons of suffering. King David was doing just this in Psalm 4, 6, and 7. He wrote, Many people will say, Who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, Lord. You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and new wine. At that time, David was in hiding from his son Absalom when he was alone. He did not have much and was not receiving the kinds of plentiful and wonderful things that he was accustomed to when living in the palace. Below him, people were celebrating the harvest. They had plenty and were extremely happy and joyful. However, David, who could easily have been full of sorrow and anger, reveals himself as having even greater joy than those who are rich and abundant. It is easy for people to find momentary joy or happiness, but God calls us to even more joy in all times. Joy can be found in the great times, the hard, and even in the ordinary times of life. In James chapter 1, verses 2-4, to four, we are told, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. 
so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you can find joy in times of suffering, you will be that much closer to becoming just who God created you to be. You will have a deeper and stronger relationship with God, and you will be able to help and lead others in similar situations because your suffering will have produced steadfastness. You can then also receive joy from the fact that God deems you worthy and values you enough to continue to work in you and mold you into a better person. And this can be a difficult attitude to maintain, which is why it is necessary to look to God, for He wants to help you and He wants to give you the joy that is found in Him. Just as David found joy in his intimate relationship with God, his Creator, we too will find that being in God's presence is the only place to find joy. A heavy heart, pain, and a broken spirit may seem incurable, but under the shadow of God's wing, we can find the one thing that this world will never offer in times of suffering, and that is joy. So in your times of trouble, turn away from the world and turn to God. Do whatever you can to be with Him. Turn worship music on, read passages from Psalms, and pour your heart out to Him. Job, a man who suffered greatly, was someone who sought and received from God his joy during the times that were so terrible. He was so determined to get his answers from God that he sought God consistently and asked for his joy. Share your sufferings, share your anger, and share your pain just as Job did. However, do not forget to share your praise and thanksgivings with God, because as you do so in the midst of your pain, you will develop an attitude of thanksgiving that will help your joy to thrive. As Psalm 1611 promises, you will show me the way of life, granting life the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Joy is good for you, but it is not only you who will be affected by the joy that God gives and longs to give you, for others will be affected too. Some of the most significant people in my in-laws' walk to Christ were their friends whose young son had tragically and suddenly passed away from infection. My in-laws went to their home to visit them shortly after that their son had passed, to give them their condolences, and they were truly shocked and amazed that even though that this couple had gone through a tragedy that would bring even the strongest to their knees, they were still able to be thankful and to look on their son's life with joy. My in-laws left their house and realized that they had experienced something unusual. They had something that was worth exploring. They had something divine about them. Shortly after, my in-laws came to know Christ, and they still think of this couple and family as being most influential in leading them to Christ. They were not proclaiming anything. They did not actively try to convert my in-laws. They just lived with the joy that anchored them to Christ. They still looked to God and proclaimed Him as good, despite their pain, and seeing that joy brought my in-laws such closer to finding God for themselves. So joy overflows into the people around you. In Proverbs 17.22, we read, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. If you take anything from this message, let it be that joy has the incredible power to carry you through the darkest of times and to also minister to the people around you. Ask God to bless you with His joy and then choose to find joy today wherever you are and in whatever you are doing. Find joy in the ordinary. Take the time each day to orient your attitude and your heart to a place of joy before even beginning to experience the day. And I can promise you that this will be a life-altering event and experience. And not only will you be sustained, but your joyous reactions can completely change the way in which someone else understands God. Further, in doing so, you will slowly be strengthened, and your heart and your relationship with God, your Father, will grow as well. He desires a relationship with you, and He especially desires you to live a joyful life. I pray that you would spend some time this week truly asking yourself why you are not joyful if joy is not a feature of your life. Ask yourself if you are letting your circumstances determine your emotions. Are you allowing another person, a coworker, or a classmate, a roommate, or a loved one to steal your joy? Make time to receive what God has promised to you, for His joy is ready and waiting 
All you have to do is take the joy that he wants to give. God bless you as you strive to walk a closer walk with God and receive all that he wants to bless you with. And please join us next week for more of God's words and promises. Well, this concludes another message from the Little Church World. I hope that this message has touched and blessed you in a special way. And again, I urge that you would reach out to some fellow Christian friends or family members and discuss this topic this week. If you have no one like this in your life, feel free to reach out to us at goodnews.thelittlechurchworld.org and we would be more than happy to connect with you.